Yay! Does this work? No. I'll try, try turning it on. Yay! Alrighty, um, this is going to be a very visual presentation. Um, thanks for coming to the presentation. Today I'll be covering why we need our phone systems to be highly available. And I'll be giving, giving you a bit of a run through of how easy it is. But before I begin, as I'm on a reasonably tight time frame here, I'll be going through these slides pretty quickly. I'll post a link to this presentation uh, after it's finished, plus you can always tweet, email, Facebook, whatever. Um, also, as this is a very visual presentation, if there is anyone who is visually impaired or has any issues seeing the slides, please feel free to come up to me at lunch or at the barbecue tonight, or wherever it's convenient, I'll be happy to run through it with you. Uh, first, a bit of background on me. I ride motor trials. As I'm not insanely rich, I can't afford to have a top-of-the-line brand new motorbike all the time. So I have a spare for when my other one breaks. Actually, as I was going through getting ready for this presentation, we seem to have a surprisingly large number of standby motorbikes. I don't know quite how this happened. <laughs> my point is, unless you have a virtually limitless budget or are a bank or something, you can't have one piece of hardware that will give you five nines. And even the stuff that says it gives you five nines can often not. This is a potential bomb. <laughs> I'll play you bastard. No, play. It's not gonna play, hang on. I'll click on this. There we go. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you'll feel just like Bruce Wayne. One of the common problems you'll have with trying to set up a higher phone system, a surprisingly common one is apathy. You can yell and scream about how there's a bomb and people just don't seem to notice. <laughs> For them, there's no problem now, um, which means as far as they're concerned, there's never gonna be a problem. Also, if they ignore the problem, it means that they're not going to have to spend any money, which is great for a manager. This doesn't mean there's not a bomb. <laughs> Other people have what seems to be, sorry, I'm too fast here. Other people have what seems to be a religious belief <laughs> that nothing's going to happen. Or maybe they're just too young to understand. <laughs> and then there are people that are so tightly focused on their current task that they can't see what's right in front of them. The, this is surprisingly common. The VMs are running, we have a spare machine, there's no potential problem here, right? Well, that's certainly a start. But sometimes, having a glitch pop up at the wrong time in the wrong location can be enough to derail a well-oiled system. There's plenty of obstacles you have to dodge when caring about high availability. Hardware, software, and with a VoIP system, we need to care a lot about um, emergencies too. You never know when you might be floating along, minding your own business, and a bomb may end up in your lap. <laughs> Uh, you probably know that sometimes it feels like no one can see the bomb. <laughs> or if they do, they don't appear to give it much thought. You don't want to end up like Batman, running around in circles, not knowing what to do. And look, while Batman can wing it, eh. <laughs> um, some, here we go. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. I bet you didn't hear that. That was Batman saying some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. That was the only thing I needed the sound for. <laughs> All joking aside, you should be caring deeply about your phones. Phones save lives. We live in a modern world where industries have machines that could kill you. And if you weren't following proper procedures, no one would even notice you were dead until you didn't clock out. <laughs> so we need to ensure that if something bad does happen, it's not our fault that they couldn't get an outside line. But I'm not here to talk about safety. There are people who care deeply about this and it's our job to give them the best tools available. HyperBX is my small part of this. Before I get started, I should point out there's nothing really new and exciting here, except for possibly the 5,000 odd lines of shell script, but that would probably be better described as crazy rather than new and exciting. All I've done is taken a bunch of pre-existing stuff and stuck it together in a reasonably sensible way. The pre-existing things I've taken are, RHEL 6 will actually we originally started on RHEL 6, um, but then as I'm not rich, we went to CentOS 6. Turns out that CentOS 6 sucks. So I've gone to Scientific Linux instead. Asterisk, which we all know is a programmable VoIP server. FreePBX, which I was the lead developer of until a couple of years ago. And of course, all the Linux HA stuff, which these guys here are awesome about. 
All of these things work. They're all well proven and have been around for years. What hasn't been around for years is a simple bit of glue to make them work together smoothly. I had the same problem with Asterisk. It was an awesome piece of software, but you programmed it in its own language that was a mixture between basic and COBOL <laughs> with, with the good bits of both taken out. <laughs> It, it had a learning curve that could more correctly be described as a learning spiral or possibly even a learning hypertoroid. <laughs> so this made it quite difficult for people to actually start using it to do more than basic things without a solid commitment to get their heads around it. So along came AMP, which became FreePBX, which grew and became the de facto GUI for Asterisk these days. There are a couple of other ones. This is the Asterisk Digium supplied one. Uh, but FreePBX does seem to be the most popular. As I'm quite limited on time and there's a pile of other people who want to talk after me, I'm not going to spend any more time on history. This is a good idea. Why didn't someone do it before? Don't know. But now it's been done, I'm going to do a quick run through of how easy it is to actually create a higher phone system from scratch. Well, not, not totally from scratch. We'll skip the first 13 billion years or so and get to about 10 minutes ago. Or actually about two minutes ago when the VMware server started working. So I've actually meant to go, here's my demonstration stuff. There's meant to be a server here, but the server is actually somewhere else. Um, I have a VMware machine that's running a pile of VMs, which is this. I've set it up to emulate a standard office network. The high PBX machines have a dedicated link between them, which is here, obviously used for DRBD, Pacemaker, and um, all the cool stuff that we do. Um, high PBX is built around a standard basic server SL6 install. Yes, it's playing. Firstly, sorry about this flickering. It's just, don't know why that happened. The reason why I want to show you the start of the OS install is to emphasize that there's a bit of a gotcha. You need to explicitly go and free up some space. I found the easiest way is to select use all space, review and modify partitioning layout, and then just delete the home volume that you created. Um, this space is automatically, automatically detected and used by uh, HyperBX and is used for the DRBD volumes. I suggested removing home because even if you do somehow manage to find a drive as small as 130 gig, removing home is enough to free up 50 gig, which is the number I randomly pulled out of the air as, as enough space. So both of these VMs have been installed with the default settings. I've done a yum update and then a git pull from the HyperBX repo, and that's it. So this now fades out. Go away. There we go. The two machines are called master and slave. I've got a couple of photos from a real life HyperBX install and I know that calling the master and slave is wrong, but I have a reason. I, he actually had a go at me about this on IRC the other day. The names are hard coded into the installer. It actually changes the name of the machine in the installer if you haven't called them that anyway. Yes, I am that nasty. They're called master and slave mainly because of the Astrobanks. Astrobanks are USB connected uh, hardware interfaces and they have two USB interfaces. And unfortunately for me, whilst they were originally labelled master and slave, which led to the naming of master and slave, they're now labelled main and backup, which has left me with an annoyingly large bug to fix, which I'm studiously ignoring and considering supplying stickers instead. Anyway, Astrobanks have enough smarts to listen to whichever port is trying to talk to it, they're nifty pieces of hardware. And they're Austel certified, which is actually a nice bonus, seeing that random Chinese imports are often full of rubbish and fall apart as soon as they're under a bit of stress. However, in this demo it's irrelevant. We're not going to be connecting to a physical phone cable. All we're doing is Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Now, everyone here has probably already got CSIP simple because the original plan was that no one would know about this free SIP until now. But then the organisers went, no, we're going to have a mass riot at registration, so pre-announce it. So everyone should already have their SIP accounts. If they don't, there's a pile of them here. Help yourself. Um, Blah, 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 blah. Most of this stuff I can be skipped. Um, if you're on an S2, the S2 does not have the SIP client. They've removed it. So download CSIP Simple, which is that QR code. Um, so what I'm doing is a full install. This should take about five minutes on the master and about one minute on the slave. That's how long it takes. I'll test some phones, do a failover. Actually, I'm not going to test some phones because we've done it slightly differently. But anyway, we'll do a failover and we have a bit of a play. Everyone should have that now. I have cheated a little bit. I've already run the start of the installer, which disables SE Linux, insists you reboot, and then downloads and installs the extra RPMs required. Here's the network diagram, and I'm gonna use exactly those IP addresses. So, here's the plan. Let's see whether this actually works. 
So if I drag this over here, yay, it works. Now, of course, I need my script, which I've managed to lose. That was one of the things I was meant to have open before, and I didn't read that bit. This is the, um, the logo I was looking for earlier. Anyway. <laughs> She tweeted, she warned me not to do this. I did it anyway. Okay, so let's start the install. Hello. Is there any way you can do the colors of putty? Yeah. That is really, really. That looks really good at home, I swear. <laughs> I can't even see the mouse. Ah, look at that. That's better. That works. Is that good for everybody? Yes. Thank you, IV team. Thank you. You guys rock. So, this is what we do. This, I should have done this before, there's a bit of DNS delay. The first thing it does is add all the repos and ensure that all the packages are installed, which I've already done. There's a 60 second DNS timeout here. After this, it asks which machine it's being run on, which is going to happen in about another 30 seconds. So I can do a little tap dance while we're waiting if you want, or you can't see me, which is even better. This is why I should have done this before, but. Twilight is best pony. Sorry? <laughs> Twilight. <laughs> Twilight! No! That's it! <laughs> Alrighty, go. Um, I've actually already run the start of this. So it's asking whether I'm creating a new cluster. Yes, I am. God, I hope I am. Right, I've stuffed up. <laughs> um, normally it asks you all of this stuff. Um, it asks you what volume groups you want to use and all the rest. And this is what happens when you don't test your stuff because your VM wears up. Well, it turns out we've actually probably already got a high PBX cluster up and running. Yes, we do. Look at that. How quick was that? <laughs> um, to start again, it'll take another 10 minutes, so I'm just going to bypass all of that. Um, it's really, it's very simple. I'm happy to show you at lunch or after, after here, whatever. Um, so what we'll do is I'll just, I'm sorry, we'll just go straight to the failover bit because that actually works. We have, um, as you'd know, we have a VoIP server here, which is running live. It's got free phone calls, and it's actually in production now. Um, this is just a quick run through for anyone who hasn't set up CSIP Simple. Pick basic. The account name should be something descriptive so you know what it is. The user is the extension that's on your bit of piece of paper. The server is lca.hypbx.org. I didn't update that last night because I was too busy getting network issues sorted out. The password is on your sheet. This is not secure. It's 30 seconds, here's 30 seconds of me lecturing you on security. Assume that I am a black hat and assume that I'm recording the audio of every call. I'm not, but this is not a secure network. Don't talk about anything you wouldn't want anyone with a wireless sniffer to use against you. Have fun, play with it, call your friends, but don't rely on it and don't trust it's secure. For all I know, there's a new zero day and the machine's already been rooted and owned in the 30 seconds it's been online. There is an emergency service available on it, but please use it as your last choice. If you do dial triple zero, it'll do its best to put you through to the emergency services. However, it's not as accurate as using your mobile's emergency service number. So if you do require emergency, emergency assistance, do not rely on this. Dial triple zero and pick mobile rather than SIP, but it will make its best effort. Now, onto the fun stuff. First of all, uh, I missed a line then. Onto the fun stuff. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Actually, we've got more than, more than a couple of minutes because I didn't do the install. And I'm a fat bastard that's going to waste away if he doesn't stuff his face and I didn't bring my bacon sock with me. 
So let's break some stuff. For those who have their phones registered, call the person sitting next to you, call your mum, or you can dial star 43 and get the echo test. That just repeats back to you what you say and gives you an idea of how much latency you have. For those that don't have their phone set up or don't have a smartphone, I'll just have these phones here call each other. Can we have the lights back on? Please, AB guys. You guys rock. So I've got a whole pile of phones here. 778, 779, that one's broken, good o. 779. Please work. Yay, it works. This works. So we'll just put one on hold. <laughs> so I'll just leave I'll leave that going so you can hear it a little bit. <laughs> It's all right, it's gonna break very, very quickly. Here is our live machine. And I'll just open this console up. Another thing I didn't drag. This is the actual VMware console of the machine. That's all running on master, as you can see there. Um, here it says started master, they're all running on master. We're running on master. I'm now gonna kill this machine. Die. That's it, it's gone. Now, this phone system has already failed over. In the time it's taken me to walk around here, I just need to actually hang the phones up, it's already, it's already back. Oh, you prick. <laughs> well, it is actually up. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't test. We'll try to call it the other way. You wouldn't believe how many times this worked at home. No, it's not working. Well, normally it works. I'm blaming it on the network guys, personally. Yeah, evil Steve's gonna come and set me on fire shortly. We'll just open up the, um, the master, and if it hasn't started up then Sorry, slave. If it hasn't started up, then you can all laugh at me. Or I've done something really clever, like um, having having master set offline, having slave set offline, a uh, standby. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is this is exactly true. So this is the other machine. Can I have a? There we go. Look, look what some idiot did. Yep. That's what the idiot did. No, nah, that serves me right. A hundred percent serves me right. Um, if you want to turn the lights off, it just it's just a very basic um, pacemaker and chorusync setup, DRBD. So everything's actually started straight back up on master again. Oh, except for asterisk, which hasn't started for some reason because it's got cranky at me. I do apologize for that being an epic fail demonstration. Normally that works. Um, don't I feel like a wally now? I thought I was gonna be so funny rickroll you and then, and then, and then have it work. That <laughs> the rickroll worked, but nothing else did. <laughs> but it's not Friday. All right. So that was when we killed it, and it should have worked just like magic. But not that magic and not that magic, but that magic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I will do this again if anyone cares, but look, it, it, there's, there's nothing complex here. The hardest bit is figuring out what needs to be high av, and that's what I've done for you. We've got MySQL, we've got asterisk, I've written an asterisk OCF agent, but Florian tells me, has actually been already superseded. Didn't you, didn't you say it was the... Well, we have one upstream, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, after I wrote one and then didn't submit it upstream because it was mercurial and I went, oh, I'll, I'll give it to them you know, when I've got it a bit better, they, Florian went and, went and wrote one himself as well. Um, Just reviewed that one, I can't take credit for that. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, it's not magic. It's, it, it's easy because of the massive amount of work that people in the FOSS community have put into these sort of cool things. I have merely built a tiny shack on the massive foundations that many people have built and all of us wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for them. Um, a bit of a quick plug on the shoulders of giants. I'd like to encourage everyone who's interested in, <laughs> in VoIP to head off to the Serval Project on Wednesday. They've taken over studio and are doing two presentations. It's awesome and really, really cool. And it works with Android and it's in the App Store now. Hopefully we've got a time for some more questions before lunch and none of them about why didn't it work, you stupid bastard. Anyone? No, you all hate me because it didn't work. That's fair enough. What time on Wednesday? Um, Wednesday afternoon in studio. The server guys are there. We have one over there. That would have worked really well if I hadn't had the other node offline. Really, it would have. How survivable is the media of these calls? Is it being proxy? Not survivable at all. Okay. Not, no, it, it, and to have survivable media is really, really hard. Because you're going to have to have the streams running in parallel to different servers and have both of them process processing the call, discarding one until this one falls over and then immediately bringing this one online. So, not survivable. No. Sorry? and IP address? That, that's exactly what we do. We fail over the MAC address and the IP address. We have these five floating IP addresses, um, which is asterisk, HTTPD, MySQL. Um, there's two spares. The first spare is for DHCP because these phones can be provisioned via DHCP and there's also, as part of HyperBX, which I didn't have time to go into, there's a pile of Active Directory integration, which I know sucks, and, but that's why the... Um, we just go back here. Back here, that's what this, this server here is for. This cluster down here will quiz Active Directory for people's real names, for their phone numbers, and it will propagate that directly into FreePBX. At the front. Well, that's not my problem. Uh, Active Directory, uh, the question was what happens when AD fails? I don't care. The only thing I'm using Active Directory for is when you're provisioning an account. Um, in Active Directory, I'm sure you've all probably seen it, if you haven't, consider yourself lucky. The user properties, you've got a phone number and an extension field in there. If those fields are propagated, HyperBX will suck that out of Active Directory and create an extension to match that user. So we've recently done a big rollout at the power station in Gladstone, which Daryl and the guys up there are doing, uh, were involved in, and that's exactly what we did. We had a pile of these phones, a barcode scanner to scan the barcodes, and we rolled out 350 odd phones, yeah, 350 phones in about a week, two weeks? Two weeks. And that was from nothing. Sorry, up the front there, Abby. If a practical question, what's the IP or host name of the SIP server here? Because it's not on the pieces of paper. LCA and that was one of those things that when I had the cards printed, I really should have actually put on the cards, but I didn't. Um, I'll update the website, pointing to it later. You don't have to use Active Directory though, right? You can use like no, LDAP no. or something? No, no, yeah. no. Yeah. You can quite happily use FreePBX, and this is what this is. Um, this is actually a, um, this is going to be far too big for this screen, but I'll just drag this tab across here. That's not that bad. No, it is. So that is our live FreePBX server that's actually running the, the conference now. So you'll see we have a SMEG load, that's a, sorry, a, a, an Imperial SMEG load of extensions there. That's everyone who's registered the server, or every extension that I've created. Um, so this is FreePBX, and this is, I've actually, as I said, I used to be the lead dev of FreePBX. FreePBX is now at version 2.10, or almost at 2.10. I've owned, I've taken ownership of 2.9 now, and I am the long-term maintainer of 2.9. Avi has another question at the back. Your PBX time zone is still set to Queensland? Yes, it's meant to be because I hate you. Okay. <laughs> the, the question was, my, my time zone is set to Queensland, and the answer is yes, because I hate you. <laughs> No, no, no daylight saving. We don't need daylight savings, we're tropical. What are you guys whinging about down here? 
One at the front. Could you show us how to do the setup again? Set up SIP. Set up SIP. Yes, absolutely. It's if you've got C SIP simple. Yep. He says finding a mouse pointer. Here we go. Let's move the actual useless window out the way. So you go to add accounts. Pick basic. You should have this screen. The account name is Linux Config U. Or look again, this is just a descriptive name for when you actually make a call. Your user is the extension number on the sheet. The server is lca.hypbx.org. And the password is the secret that's on the sheet as well. So again, this has been um, sponsored by Factortel, who were actually really nice when I said, oh, I'm thinking about doing a, doing a high F VoIP presentation at uh, LCA. And they went, that's cool. How many calls would you like? Is 400 simultaneous outgoing calls enough? And I went, yes, that'll do quite nicely. Thank you very much. So um, they've basically given us unlimited calls. If we do go mental and start spending all our time on the phone to Belarus or something like that, I'm sure they'll get grumpy about that. But feel free to call overseas, New Zealand, no problems. We were messing around calling New Zealand before and it worked perfectly and there was bugger all latency, it was awesome. Cool, um, on that note, we're, um, it's about 25 past 12 now, which uh, means that we're just slightly into a lunch break. Um, do you want to you hang around here a bit more? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll hang um, around here if anyone's got so any if anybody's really keen. Oh, I'm quite happy to actually run through this presentation again and do the install if anyone wants to see it. But we'll have to do it over lunch because you guys mm -hmm. want to go and eat. And I'm sure you don't have your bacon socks either. Yeah, but uh, other than that, uh, please thank Rob. Thanks, guys. Um, and we'll be back. Uh, Rob will be back again.